Native Americans faced genocide big time and then and then serious discrimination. But it was different because white America romanticized uh, Indians from the very beginning, even as they were even when they were killing them. I love the new book, which I want to talk to you about, but I had one quick question for you. There was a, a little, it's kind of a little aside in the Clinton book, which always stuck with me as, <laughs> as a user of note cards. I just wanted to know more about it. You talk yes. about his sort of index Rolo, uh, Rolodex uh, card system, and I just, uh, I, w- I wanted to know about it. Well, uh, that was my first book, Ryan. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I actually talked to Taylor Branch and Robert Carroll about how they organized. Yeah. And and I think it was Taylor who said that he used index cards. So I thought, well, what the hell? I, you know, it was, it was 1992 when I started it. It was sort of before the era of, of all of the uh, ways you could do it online. And as I said, I'm a technological idiot. So it sounded good to me. And I literally had probably 5,000 index cards um, in shoeboxes uh, arranged by both chronology and theme, and it worked. I, I've only done that for three. I stopped doing it after about three books, um, but that's how I got started. I, I'm a note card person uh, myself. I'm working on uh, my next book, and I've got my note cards in front of me. Uh, so I love hearing that that Robert Caro <laughs> and, and Taylor Branch both used them, uh, uh, you as well. I just thought I remembered in the book, didn't Clinton use note cards? Like he wrote down on like an index card, everyone he ever met and what he could do for them. (laughs) There was no connection between that and why I did it, but you're absolutely right. Um, That was probably in the 19, in the seventies when he was starting to run for office and he, he kept it for a few decades, but yeah, anybody he met, he would write down their name, anything he could know about them. Um, It's interesting because, you know, Clinton's um, intelligence sort of goes towards almost a photographic memory. Mm. So even though he had those note cards, he could meet somebody who he hadn't seen in 30 years and remember not only their name, but their parents' name and maybe even their phone number. (laughs) So, but it all started with those note cards. Anybody he met was both a future voter or a future donor or somebody that, that could be helpful to him along his political rise. Well, and, and don't you think that uh, with your experience with note cards, certainly it's been confirmed with mine, I feel like the act of putting it on the note card improves the memory, even if, although you are having this second backup that is the note card. Absolutely right. And that's why I still, I, even though I don't use note cards as much anymore, I still do everything I can to make sure that whatever I write down is etched in my memory. So I'll, I'll transcribe all of my own interviews. I won't have somebody else do it. Um, I will take my notes um, from three ring binders and then put together a master notes that helps me sort of etch it in my memory again. So I do all of the same things I did with note cards. I just use it a computer now instead. Mostly. Yeah, it's like having the multiple touch points with the information allows you to then when you're when you bump up into it in your notes or you know you're 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 chugging along and then suddenly the exact right connection pops to you because you've you've taken the time to interact with it on multiple occasions. You know, that's true and of course there are people from um, younger generations who can do all that automatically in various, you know, programs. I can't and it wouldn't work for me, even if I could, because it wouldn't stick in my mind the same way. So it has, I have to re- really remember it. And to do that, I have to visualize it, see it, repeat it. I, I'm the same way. And I, I do, when I read these epic books that you and your sort of elite class of uh, biographers write, I'm, I'm always amazed at how you manage to keep all this information straight. And I've got to imagine it's all about the organization and you're not just sitting down and seeing where it takes you. There has to be a plan and kind of a stra- a plan of attack. Yeah, there is um, definitely. You know, as I said, I take, you know, now I use three ring binders uh, of all of my notes and then I take those and turn it into a master notes. 
But, uh, you know, I have one of my friends, Rick Atkinson, who's a brilliant historian about uh, World War II and now the Revolutionary War. He writes um, outlines that are longer than his books. Wow. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, I have all my notes. Uh, I'll probably take about one page of a uh, of a some kind of a way to you know I use I use um, these big artist books um, pads and I'll I'll sort of oh, can I see yeah um, like this oh got it okay okay like a sketchbook yeah a sketchbook and on that I will for each proposed chapter write sort of what I call the stations of the cross the points I want to make and how to get from here to there. Yeah. But I don't do it in the great detail because there is a certain magic to to what can come into your head from from the very creative process of writing. And so I always allow room for that within the, the organization of the chapter. I sort of, um, it's another variation of what I call freedom through discipline. You know, once I have the discipline of the chapters and of my notes and of my understanding of that, that's when I can improvise somewhat within that that structure. Well, uh, that's that's very fitting. My next book is uh, on the virtue of discipline, uh, as it happens. Uh, I'm doing I'm doing a series on the cardinal virtues. So I did courage. I just finished uh, discipline. Now I'm now I'm writing about justice. But um, the, it, it it is interesting that that paradox. Like you would think, being very regimented and uh, orderly in what you do, it might be constraining, but it's almost like you have just the right amount of constraints and that creates the freedom to sort of take the thought where it leads. But if you haven't done the work, if you haven't allowed, uh, laid the groundwork, the freedom is overwhelming and you don't make any forward progress. That's exactly right. I actually learned some of that from my book on Vince Lombardi and the Jesuits, the whole yeah. freedom through discipline notion and how he could take one play you know, he from learning from the Jesuits, he could take one play, his famous Packer sweep, and provide so many different variations of that. The players knew it so well that they knew how to respond in 50 different ways to what was coming at them. And I, I think of that for musicians, you know, great jazz musicians or any sort of musician has to learn the, the fundamentals first and then they can improvise or a great artist. And I think writing is the same way. So I've tried to apply that to everything I do. Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. It was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marcus Aurelius says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you gonna wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And it's, it, it, I think people wanna think that it's about sitting down and just letting the inspiration take you where it takes you, but you need, you need the sort of the channeling of that energy, at least in some vague overall direction, especially I, I've got to imagine when you're trying to get to the end of a 600 or 700 page, <laughs> 70 year span of someone's life. Absolutely. Uh, you know, a biography helps in that, in that process because there's a natural skeleton to it, a structure sure. of a life. And uh, if the person is, is no longer around, of course, for Clinton and Obama, I had to figure out how to create this, sort of an artificial um, place to end the stories. Um, but but for someone like Jim Thorpe or Vince Lombardi or Clemente, um, that structure is already there. Yeah, that that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I I, um, I I was actually writing in the discipline book about that famous John Wooden scene where he would, you know, bring in the athletes and they'd think he'd be giving them all this inspirational talk. And then he'd walk them through, um, uh, like how to put on their socks and shoes, uh, <laughs> exactly. which is, I, I, I think, it, I, I don't remember if you disputed it as a, as apocryphal or not in the Lombardi book, but the whole idea of gentlemen, this is a football, right? Like you oh, have no, to, you he, have... <laughs> he really said it. Uh, yeah. it was after yeah. his second season. And of course the great line is Max McGee saying, uh, coach, could you slow down? You're going too fast for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, 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 uh, and I was, as I was reaching it, uh, the, um, there's a line from, uh, Zella Fitzgerald or Zelda Fitzgerald, which 
you know, her own life sort of proves what she's saying, but she said, it's with loose ends that men hang themselves. And I thought that that's a good way to think about these tiny little details. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I keep trying not to hang myself. <laughs> <laughs> any, any day we can, uh, we can get through it without that is a successful day, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things I loved, uh, I, I read the book and then I, I read the the New York Times review about it, which was very po- uh, positive. But I loved the opening scene, um, I, and I forget who wrote it. But they were talking about um, how they 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 were interviewing some like ninety year old marathon runner, and all the ninety year old marathon runner wanted to talk about was how they'd met Jim Thorpe as a young person, and it, to me, it brings home something that we often miss on these stories. Um, which is that they feel very distant to us, but they still exist almost in living memory. Like the, the, the injustices and the uh, unbelievable athletic achievements of a man born in the late 1880s, like it's effectively still with us. Yeah, uh, that was Abel Kiviat, who was uh, a New Yorker, a long distance runner that that uh, Keith Oberman met uh, yes. while Kiviat was still alive. He wasn't alive for me when I was doing the book, but I found several oral interviews of him. Um, and yeah, I mean, Thorpe was born in 1887, right? He, he reached uh, his, the pinnacle of his athletic uh, fame in, in 1912, you know, 110 years ago. And yet there are, you know, you can almost find, I couldn't find anybody who was obviously around during his greatest era, but there sure. still are those connections that make it uh, feel closer and come alive even all of that time ago. And and how quickly that intersects with, you know, major world events, right? You're talking about Dwight Eisenhower playing against Jim Thorpe. <laughs> uh, and I love, there's an anecdote in S.C. Gwynn's book about uh, the invention of the forward pass in football where like Dwight Eisenhower is playing for West Point when the passing game in football is invented. Again, we we think about these things as, you know, existing in perpetuity, but the, the, the some of these breakthroughs were like very recent and some of these m- major figures of history intersect with the sports world in a way that you wouldn't believe. Yeah, the, the forward pass was only uh, legalized um, around 1904 um, and Pop Warner, who was the Carlisle coach, was one of the earlier proponents of it. Um, he didn't invent it, as some people say, but he was an early proponent. And, uh, you know, it, the, those Carlisle teams um, were using the forward pass when a lot of schools weren't. But before that, you couldn't. Uh, one of the things I love about um, that era um, is the things that you could do that you can't do now. You know, there's one scene where where they're playing the University of Chicago and an end line lines up right by the opposition, uh, you know, the, the out of bounds and goes around the opposition bench and comes out on the other side to catch a pass. You know, wouldn't that be fun if you could do that today? <laughs> well, and, and this isn't that far, even another, you know, sort of intersection of a major historical event. This isn't that far from Theodore Roosevelt and the sort of invention of, you know, modern college athletics uh, and the invention of, you know, helmet and protective gear in sports um and and how uh yeah these things didn't these things just weren't always with us but there were people that predated them uh or people who were there you know uh, present at the creation so to speak yeah some things weren't with us some things were so um you know the violence was always there um it's there today in a different form with cte and mm-hmm. and the effects of that despite all of the modern equipment but hard to believe that that this violent sport was even more violent, um, yeah. you know, around the turn of the century. Um, Did and he play so, in the time of the flying V sort of formations. Uh, no, it, that was outlawed right before Thorpe got there, hmm. and that was part of what Theodore Roosevelt and and called the, all of the leaders of college sports together to try to get some rules that would prevent the flying wedge and all of that. So that was no longer allowed. So in that sense, um, things were different. In another sense, though, um, they, they haven't changed because human nature doesn't change. So, you know, sure. I write a lot about the notion of the fallacy of the innocent past, you know, that, oh, if only we could go back to the good old days when everything was amateur and, and you know, people played for the love of it and they weren't getting $240 million contracts, you know, that that's all baloney. I mean, that, that sort of 
form of corruption of sports has always been there. Well, and the, and the double standard therein, you know, you, you obviously talk a lot about in the book about his medals being stripped of him. And then I, I, in the discipline book, I wrote a lot about Lou Gehrig. And there was a uh-huh. college athletics uh, or an amateur uh, eligibility scandal in his career. But like you said in the book, he uh, uh, Thorpe wasn't informed enough or uh, let inside the club enough to know you're supposed to do that under a fake name. And so he got caught when many of the best athletes of that era, you know, were were making a mockery of the same rules that, you know, this guy gets the book thrown at him for. Yeah, you're right. Gehrig played under an, an alias. Dwight Eisenhower played under the name Wilson in the Kansas State League. Um, literally scores of college athletes were playing under pseudonyms so they could maintain their eligibility. Now, I don't think I, I don't think it was uh, Thorpe's ignorance, um, which is what Pop Warner tried to claim that oh, he was just a dumb Indian. I just think he didn't he didn't um, you know he he wasn't in on the the that part of it. You're right. That's what I mean. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. But it's he, not he, that played, he was stupid. He just wasn't no. corrupt enough. <laughs> yeah. He played under the name Jim Thorpe. Um, and Carlisle Indian athletes had been doing that for quite a while. Um, Pop Warner knew about it, you know, and I said, no, you know, we'll talk about it. I mean, uh, a lot of people knew about it and lied to save their own reputations. What, what was stunning to me too, you look at the cover of the book and you know, if it wasn't a black and white photo, he looks like he could have stepped off, you know, football practice last week. Like he, it, <laughs> you know, you look at a lot of the old sports photos and, and some of the ones uh, that, are, that are in the book, you definitely go, OK, this is a this was an right. athlete from a different era, especially like yes. baseball and stuff. But just as as far as like a raw athletic figure, he looks like he could be playing professional sports right now. It's it's pretty remarkable uh, physique style to like it, it, it. It's it's surreal almost. Well, it's uh, it's a paradigm. I mean, you look at that. I mean, it's magnetic, electric. Yeah. I mean, he is sort of the classic uh, athlete, you know. And, yeah. and as soon as I saw it, I said, you know, thank you. That's the, that's the cover of the book. You know, it just radiates that. And you're right; it is timeless in that sense. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, he looks like he could be an Abercrombie and Fitch model or something. Like it's, <laughs> you know, he doesn't. He doesn't look. And I wonder how much of that was, you know, him sort of not being fully assimilated into society. So he's not, you know, he's not as trendy of a figure then. He's sort of. Uh, it's. It's more of the the raw, unvarnished sort of athleteness in him. Probably in the same way we can see ourselves in a in a Greek statue of a wrestler or something. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, it's 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 just so natural, I guess you'd say. You know, it looks pure. And and so it's timeless, meaning it could be in ancient Greece or it could be today. Yes, yes. And was he uh, just one of those natural, amazing athletes or was there sort of the work ethic behind it? You know, like, I, I, obviously he works very hard. You can't be good at sports if you don't work very hard. Right. But was he like a, a freak of nature or was he more of a workhorse of an athlete? You know, I, I, I think he was both. I mean, I definitely had that. Uh, you know, he, when he got to Carlisle, the Indian school at age six, 16, he was only 5'5 five, five and weighed 115 pounds. So yeah. he had this enormous growth spurt. Um, but... He did have natural strength, speed, and um, jumping ability, all of the things that made him that great all-around athlete. Um, but he, I think it's kind of a tendency um, for sports writers and others, you know, if there's a, you know, especially an African-American or in his case, a Native American, if they, if they, have, if they have those skills, they're sort of, well, they're just naturals at it, yes. you know, but they work. And, and Thorpe, not only worked physically at it and had since he was young, I mean, you know, in other ways, hunting and fishing and walking long, long distances certainly helped his stamina. Um, You know, jumping out of trees into the North Canadian River probably helped him in some ways, you know, all the things he did as a kid. Um, But he not only worked physically, although there was a, a somewhat racist stereotype that he didn't have to train for the Olympics when in fact there are pictures showing him showing that he trained and the other athletes saying it. Um, but he also was a little bit ahead of his time 
uh, mentally, I'd say, you know, he could envision things, mm. you know, as that same Abel Kiviat told Keith Oberman, you know, you could do something and Thorpe could watch you do it and do it better than you could. Yes. And, and he, he had that sort of mental visualization of what he was going to achieve um, that also helped him. Yeah, I remember I, I read Bo Jackson's uh, memoir a few years ago, and he was just sort of like, yeah, I don't practice. I'm just this way, you know? Um, you, you, it, so it does seem like there are certain people who are just, you know, uh, a one one in a trillion package, not that they they don't also have a hunger and a tenacity and a skill for the game. But, you know, it's, it's hard to tell because you can't really watch clips of him was he, you know, no, what, right. what was his playing style? What did he, like, was he one of those graceful natural athletes or was he, uh, you know, one of those sort of sculpted himself into that? Yeah, you know, I, you're right. I wish I could have seen more uh, film of him um, during that era. Um, but there isn't, there are enough descriptions of him from yeah. not just sports writers, but even the great poet Marianne Moore, who was his teacher at Carlisle, you know, and she had a, a description of his sort of readiness to pounce um, uh, with equilibrium with plenty and reserve, you know, she described it, you know, that sort of pent up ready energy. Um, so, I, you know, I had to base it more on that than any film that I could watch. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Bo Jackson because – I don't believe that either. I mean, he might have said it, but he certainly, I mean, you have to practice to play football. And I consider Bo Jackson perhaps um, the closest when people ask me who's the who's sure. Jim Thorpe of the modern era. I would say it was him, you know, that he well, you not know, just you watch that You watch that clip of him breaking the bat over the leg and you're just like, this guy, it was dealt a different set of cards than, than not just the rest of us, than even everyone else on the field. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And he, you, he's the one he's the one who probably could have been a great decathlete too. Yes. Um, you know, and the the and now that you can pole vault with a pole vault that doesn't break, you know, a pole that doesn't break. I mean Jim Thumb could barely pole vault because he'd break the pole, you know. Uh, but that's the one uh, event in the decathlon that was a little problematic for him. But um, strength, speed and jumping ability, they both had it in, you know, just in tremendous qualities. Yeah, you you watch the the Bo Jackson highlight reel, and, you know the clip where he runs up the side of the wall to right. catch that ball, and you just you you think of what what would they have captured, you know? And you you talk about in the book some of his some of Thorpe's stories or legends that even he passed along, but you got to imagine there must have been moments that happened that didn't get reported by reporters that would have just taken your breath away, just the sheer physicality of what someone like him must have been able to pull off in certain moments. I, I think that's true. And, you know, because we can't see it, you know, I wish I could have, I wish there were a film of that 1912 game against Army, you know, for instance, or against Harvard the year before, or to see him punt a, a ball from end zone to end zone, which he did, you yeah. know, all of these different things. Uh, uh, that, you know, I know happened because I can document them from many different sources, but I just couldn't see. Well, and it, it's one of the things we we don't really un, we don't really take into account when we think about, you know, these sports figures from the past. It's not just, you know, the uniforms or the technology of the stuff, but like the grueling nature of their uh the, the game itself, like before they understood about sleep, before they understood that you shouldn't smoke before a game, you know, all this stuff. When I was reading about Gehrig, you're like, you, you think about the streak, you think about 2,100 games in a row, and then you go, wait, you know, he was traveling by train, you know, yes. he was playing often multiple double, double headers in the same week, you know, and then in the off season, he'd have to go barnstorm in Japan or something, right? You know, you, when you think of the toll of like the multiple back-to-back -back World Series, et cetera, like Jim, Jim Thorpe, like to travel to the Olympics, you know, isn't flying there in a chartered airplane, right? Like <laughs> he's pulling this off with none of the advantages that we're thinking about today. Oh, I know. I mean, sometimes I just marvel at how did he get there? You know, like he's by playing. Boat, right? uh, he, well, no, for the, I mean, for other, yes, absolutely. He got to Stockholm by boat, but like he's in Chicago coaching 
uh, a game for Indiana University, and all of a sudden the next you know noon the next day he's playing a pro football in Ohio. You know, yeah. I mean that has to be exhausting, right? Yeah. Uh, so many instances of that where yeah they took trains or or in his case he probably could have uh, gone by car, but cars weren't the same then either, and nor were the highways. You know, yeah. so that that that's another sort of hidden part of the of the of the uh, grueling nature of what they were doing. Yeah, they're not sitting in an air-conditioned locker room during halftime. They're not popping an Advil. You know, they don't even have the same kind of athletic tape. You know, just just the toll that this must have taken on the body. And then we go, well, why were they this way when they were older? It's like, because he basically got in multiple car accidents professionally, like every day of his life. That, exactly. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and played to a fairly, I mean, for someone, and they, you know, it, just take football. Football. I mean, he was playing sixty minutes a game. You know, he was. Yeah, sure. There was no. You were coming out. You were playing offense and defense. He was playing running back, which takes the most grueling toll on on anyone. Sure. And defensive back or linebacker, where he was tackling people. There was a collision on every play he played for every football game. Yeah. And his shoes probably weighed five pounds each, and uh, you know his uniform was made of wool. And exactly, just, just the you just think of the the headwinds that these guys had. It must have been incredible, and that's not even getting into the extra psychological headwinds uh, and right. the adversity that he would have grown up with. I mean, it's yes. it's kind of remarkable that he was still standing at all by the time he he finished playing. That's the way I felt, and then. And then that you know that final uh, athletic endeavor where he's forty five years old playing baseball for Harjo's Indians, um, you know a traveling team going around playing the Negro League teams and and the East Coast and still hitting you know still still doing well at, at age forty five was kind of amazing. Yeah, I was just reading about Satchel Page, and you know, he uh-huh. gets drafted like in his fifties or whatever, and he's still striking batters out. And yeah, for like, the Cleveland Indians, I know. Yeah, how good must he have been in his prime, or how good could he have been, uh, just like Thorpe, if the deck hadn't been so thoroughly stacked against him? I mean, it, it sort of boggles the imagination. It does, and uh, I was I was I was delighted when I saw that Thorpe had competed against so many of those. African American players before they got their shot too. Not just Satchel Page and Cool Papa Bell um, and uh, Josh Gibson, but in football he played against Paul Robeson, you know, and Fritz Pollard, right? The wow. early, yeah, sure. Well, yeah, that's that's remarkable. I didn't really think about that because of the way that his career went. His achievements are almost more uh, translatable to today because he wasn't always in a sort of artificially, uh, you know, anti-competitive environment that even a Babe Ruth or a a Joe DiMaggio or a a Lou Gehrig would have been, like where many of the best players, they didn't have to face. And that was intentional. Yes. Um, Football was not segregated then. There weren't very many um, black players, but but Fritz Pollard was a player coach and a great one. And Robeson played a couple of years before he went on to his uh, fame as a you know an opera singer, an actor, and all of that, and an activist. Um, you know, I, I write in the book that the one you know Thorpe met almost every famous person of the first half of the 20th century, from Eisenhower and Omar Bradley and George Patton to Bob Hope and and John Ford and everybody out in Hollywood. Um, but the one place I would have wanted to have been was at a field in Milwaukee in 1922 when Thorpe, the colossus of, of Native Americans, was on one team and Paul Robeson was on the other. You know, to see that game uh, would have been just awesome. He's sort of like a Zelig figure in sports. It's kind of unbelievable. Or a Forrest Gump, you know, that he would just have met. or And these aren't just like, hey, they passed each other on a train somewhere, but they seem to have you know, gone head to head. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Yeah. It was a fun part of the book to do, sort of document all of the famous people that, that he encountered, you know, I mean, Eisenhower uh, famously said in the, after that West Point game, yeah, I tackled Jim Thorpe once. I mean, he tackled him once in the whole game. Thorpe eventually knocked him out of the game. You know. 
Yeah, it, it, it must have been weird to be this Native American guy. You're so talented. And then you're just like, oh, yeah, this guy I played against just he just conquered like he just won a world <laughs> war, you know, um, like like where these figures go on. And and that must have been strange and obviously sad, too. You know, you die in this trailer, more or less in obscurity and poverty, the world sort of having the world that sort of extracted what it wanted from you and then passed you by. Yeah, the last 25, 30 years of his life were, were difficult. You know, I, I kept rooting for him for something better to happen. Uh, but, you know, some of it was, you know, his own human uh, flaws. You know, he had trouble drinking and he wasn't home much. And uh, the first two wives divorced him because of that and his drinking. And he didn't see his seven children as much as, as I would have, you know, liked, or they would have liked, sure. that's more important, um, <laughs> during their childhoods. Um, but he kept persevering. He kept trying no matter what obstacles were in his way. And I came to admire that. But you're right. I mean, he wanted more than anything, well, I'd say two things. He wanted to be a, a college football coach. You know, he got that chance once for one season with Indiana University. Then the head coach was fired, and that was the end of that. And he wanted to somehow set up some kind of a, a hunting lodge or fishing lodge um, because he loved to hunt and fish more than anything else. And that never quite happened either. And, you know, there are points in his life where he's writing letters and it's it's almost like Willie Loman. You know, he keeps thinking that something good is going to happen. and there, These opportunities are going to open up in Florida or Cuba or somewhere, you know, in Nevada, and they never do. Um, and well, yes, I'll... Been- the Go hunting on. and fishing thing is an interesting, uh, again, overlap with him and Bo Jackson, who you wouldn't, uh, you know, is this sort of avid uh, bow hunter. And I wonder if it was the solitude of it, because uh, they both seem like very introverted figures. That's something you talk a lot about in the book. He was not the gregarious sort of celebrity athlete who soaked up the spotlight. Uh, he had every opportunity to, but that doesn't seem to be who he was. No, he only did it um, when he had to, um, to stay alive, you know, yeah. uh, like be a greeter in a bar or something or, or earlier, the expectations of what an Indian should do, um, which is perform like in the stereotypes that, that white society expected of them, you know, do these halftime Indian shows and things like that. But that wasn't what he wanted to do or be. And um, he was much happier just um, off by himself or with his buddies uh, hunting and fishing. The other um, historical character that I was thinking about sort of related to him, and I, I guess I don't know if they ever met, maybe you would, but I guess um, Major Taylor would have been about, what, 10 years older than than Thorpe? Another one of those sort of yes. transcendent athletes that the system chews up and spits out uh, and is more or less lost to history because it challenged the sort of uh, great white hope uh, modality of sports. Yeah, I don't know, honestly, whether they ever met. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, I do know that, um, it, you know, in the 1912 Olympics, aside from his teammate at Carlisle, Louis Tawanama, um, the two people he was closest to were um, Duke Tawanama and um, uh, uh, Howard Drew, who was a black uh, sprinter who would have been the fastest man in the world, but he got hurt during those, those Olympics. Um, but, but on the boat there and, and afterwards, those, you know, there was this small group of, of minority athletes, you know, uh, Dukes, you know, the, the Hawaiian swimmer yeah. and, and drew the, uh, the sprinter from Massachusetts, Tawanama, uh, Alex Sakalexix, another uh, marathon runner from Penobscot in Maine and Thorpe. And they sort of bonded together and they all in various ways must have felt, you know, sort of that, not isolation, but separate separation from the rest of, of the sort of, you know, wealthier amateurs of that era. What, was he more accepted in Europe? I know that sort of uh, Major Taylor goes and just makes a fortune in France, yes. uh, as entertainers often did. It was seen, you know, race was just seen differently there. But but how, how did that go for Thorpe? Uh, was he sort of feted about in Europe or was that a one-time thing when he was in the Olympics? It was not a one-time thing. I mean, actually the year after that, 
he toured the world um, with this New York Giants baseball team and the Chicago White Sox. And they went from Japan to China to Philippines, Australia, Egypt, and then Europe. And nobody else on those teams, even, you know, the Hall of Famers, Tris Speaker and Sam Crawford, nobody knew them. Everybody yeah. knew Jim Thorpe and they wanted to see him. So he had this, this global um, name and identity um, that, that no other really uh, American athlete of that era had. I mean, um, even the great box, you know, Dempsey um, or the tennis players or golfers were not as big as Jim Thorpe in the world in that period. He was like yeah. Muhammad Ali sort of. It, it must have been, uh, from what I've read, obviously this was in, with Taylor, but then, you know, uh, after the First World War and then the Second World War, it must have made the coming home so much harder because they had the experience, that sort of brief moment where all the baggage they were carrying and the, the, the caste system that they were so stuck in disappears for that brief moment. And they're seen for what they are, which is this amazing athlete and this interesting person and this hero and equal and peer. And then they come home and they're just quickly reminded, like, you're lower than the lowest white person. Well, Ryan, that, that's been true throughout American history. Yes. I mean, it happened to Wilma Rudolph in Rome in 1960. She came home mm -hmm. and her hometown wanted to have a segregated banquet in her honor. Um, you know, it happened to all the soldiers of World War II who came home after fighting yeah. for liberty and democracy and then had to face uh, Jim Crow segregation. And it certainly happened to Jim Thorpe after he came back. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's kind of, uh, yeah, there's this, if you think about, so he's he's one of the few that break through, right? You think about yeah. how many incredibly talented athletes were born that never got that shot or decided it wasn't worth it. Um, yeah, again, not just the, the loss of the footage of the moments he was in, but the sort of invisible graveyard of other brilliantly talented people that, that these attitudes have cost, uh, you know, the world, uh, but America specifically for, for generations. It's, it's You know, one interesting aspect to that is the difference between African Americans and Native Americans and the way that white society perceived them. Hmm. Um, so that, you know, Thorpe could play Major League Baseball, right? At a time right. when, when no black uh, baseball player could. Um, he could go to the deep South, um, Jim Crow South, and, and give speeches at a time when the only blacks at a touchdown club would be, you know, the waiters. Um, and the difference is largely that for a lot of different historical reasons, um, you know, Native Americans faced genocide big time and then, and then serious discrimination. But it was different because white America romanticized uh, Indians from the very sure. beginning, even as they were, even when they were killing them. You know, as I write in the first chapter of the book, comparing Thorpe with Blackhawk, who was his um, ancestor. Uh, in many ways, in the Sac and Fox Nation and the same clan. You know, when Black Hawk was captured after the Black Hawk War, white society went nuts to see him, right? And and sort of everybody, the, the press throughout the country covered um, his travels through the East Coast as a prisoner of war, including the Southern newspapers that never would have done that for an African-American. So, you know, both discriminated against in horrible ways, but there was this difference in that from the beginning, white society also romanticized Indians. Could he have passed as white? Was that part of it too? Like, did he, was it sort of, I mean, you, from the photo, you know, like I'm from saying. From the photo, you could like, say no, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was lighter skinned than, he had a twin brother who died sadly at age nine um, in one of those uh, Indian boarding schools um, uh, who had darker skin than Jim. Um, but no, he is, all of his features show um, that, that he was a Native American. I don't think he could have passed in that sense, but, um, but yet um, Native Americans and his status as an athlete, all of that um, helped him um, sort of at least maneuver within white society in ways that, that blacks could not. Yeah, for, for whatever reason, the convoluted, insane logic of a white supremacist system 
uh, make an exception or he's outside that system. He doesn't clearly sit here or there in the hierarchy. And, and then, you know, you look for excuses uh, when, when it benefits you. Also, I, I have to imagine in a system like that, there are probably lots of people that looked like uh, Jim Thorpe that, uh, you know, experienced a much worse version of America at that time, probably could not travel so easily in the South or somewhere else. Yeah, no doubt that his status helped him in that regard. But he he suffered enough himself, so <laughs> that was plenty. Well, how do you think about that? That's one of the I, I, uh, fascinating parts of American culture, it, particularly in these sort of minority communities, which is the person who is so mistreated and underappreciated in that system endures it with this kind of dignity and poise and does, uh, puts up with it is the wrong word. Uh, it's, it's just, um, you know, it is, it takes, I, I guess it, it, it's, it's surreal to watch someone endure with quiet dignity, what he endures when he, you know, had a- a- every incentive or reason to say like, I'm going to live in Sweden now. You know what I mean? As, as someone like Paul Robeson, you know, and, and other uh, talented African-Americans would do, yeah. Yeah, I think that that in that sense, um, Thorpe was sort of emblematic of, of all Native Americans. I mean, they, you know, they endured these horrific um, things in the Indian boarding schools, you know, where they, they were subjected to the worst kind of forced assimilation, um, you know, where there were efforts to get them to lose their religion and culture and language and cut their hair and dress them in the uniforms of the U.S. Cavalry, you know, that killed sure. their, their ancestors, all of that. And yet so many of them, the ones who, who didn't die, um, figured out how to survive and actually prevail. And so, you know, um, so many of their descendants became the lawyers and doctors and activists who have helped the, you know, Native Americans not just preserve their race, but prevail. And, you know, when Jim Thorpe was at the height of his fame in 1915, um, the most famous statue in America was called the End of the Trail, which I write about. You know, this this uh, Indian slumped on horseback. And the notion is, this is the end. You know, manifest destiny has prevailed. Um, Indians are archaic. They're on their way out. They're dying. And that really didn't happen. And so what I'm saying is they figured out ways to game the system enough and survive in it um, that they were able to get through it for the better. Did Jim Thorpe ever play lacrosse? Yeah, he did. He never, he didn't play it. Um, he didn't play it, you know, in the organized way that, that, uh, that Jim Brown did in a later generation. Yeah. Uh, but, and he was too busy, you know, I mean, uh, he was playing football or track and field at the same time of the lacrosse season. So he did manage to play baseball and um, track and field at the same time uh, for Carlisle. Um, and he did play lacrosse just, you know, and he was great at it, but it, it was not an organized sport for him. Yeah, I was. there's this new ESPN Plus documentary about PLL, the the premier lacrosse league. And if, if a big chunk of it focuses on this guy, Lyle Thompson, who's like one of the greatest lacrosse players of all time. He's Native American. He sort of yes. inherited this whole tradition of playing it where they make their own gear and stuff. It, there is a, a, a long standing sort of uh, sporting community inside uh, Native uh, the Native American reservations, I guess, probably because, you know, like it's always been in sports, there's not a lot of other avenues for advancement. Yeah, I would say that today that's reflected most in basketball and volleyball. And, you know, there are a lot of great uh, women athletes, uh, professional volleyball players from, from the reservations, um, really good basketball, you know, you know, in Arizona and the Dakotas and elsewhere, um, more than football. Um, but in, in Thorpe's era, Football was seen, you know, as in those boarding schools, it was seen as part of the assimilation process, right? right. I mean, all the, the great teams were were the upper class teams in the East Coast. And so, you know, part of the reason Carlisle had uh, emphasized football was to sort of introduce them to that white society. Sure. Yeah. And then, and then that's what puts you suddenly on the same field as 
the kids at West Point. It's kind of a, an equalizing uh, ticket to a, a level of society that you're not normally going to have access to. And Harvard and Yale and Princeton, yes. That must have been surreal too. The 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 different stratosphere economically, culturally, uh, you know, academically that suddenly Thorpe is is rubbing shoulders with, or more or less uh, driving them into the ground on the field <laughs> must have been. It must have been strange. Well, it was certainly an incentive, yeah. and no more yeah. so than that game against West Point in 1912, where you know that was that was you know that I, for my research, I went up to the Beinecke Library at Yale, where not only does it have the papers of um, Richard Henry Pratt, the founder of the Carlisle School, but also of the great uh, Native American novelist M. Scott Momaday, and he he wrote. Um, quite a, you know, he was he was really fascinated by Carlyle, and wrote a screenplay that was never produced about it in a play, and he he really sort of focused on that game against West Point in 1912 as sort of, you know, the the uh, level playing field at last. You know, after after you know the the Indians uh, ancestors had been killed by the army. You know, here they finally got to compete against them on a level playing field and crushed them 27 to six. I don't know if you've seen the show Ted Lasso, but there's that scene in the first season where the you know the sort of uh, Midwestern football coach goes overseas. He's teaching uh, soccer or he's coaching soccer, and he goes to one of the players who's a, a African. I forget which country, but he's he's sort of hands him this little green army man as a, <laughs> as a, like a token of good luck, and the guy goes. Um, where I come from, this is not a positive image or figure. <laughs> He's like, can you keep this? Right. And, right. and that, you know, uh, that must, you're right. You talk about the, the boys at the Carlisle school being forced to wear these, you know, cavalry uniforms. I've got to imagine there was a different kind of feeling fighting, uh, the, the officers at West Point. In some cases it, it was not, uh, it was those boys' father, like yes. you know, Macar MacArthur grows up on a you know a frontier uh, army base. Like it was those boys' fathers that uh, he was he was playing against, or were even in the stands. Absolutely, and uh, Custer's tomb is there, you know, only yeah. a, a mile away from where they were playing. All of that is true, and of course, there's this great um, contradiction and paradox to the whole thing, which was. The, the Carlisle Indian uh, athletes were incredibly popular wherever they went. Mm. Um, you know, they were exotic. They were not just good, but they were different. Sure. And that was part of the attraction. And yet they were playing for a school that was trying to rid them of that very heritage, you know. That was the right. point of the school. Uh, so Yes. Right. You, you, you have that horrible sort of motto in the book of, of Indian policy at that time. Kill the Indian, save the man. But that was that was what it was all about. Yes, and, and it was and, thought by the founders, you know, Pratt and and the government, and so many of the people who supported the school that they were doing good. You yeah. know that they were saving the Indians um, who had been suffering from genocide before that, and that the only way they could survive was by becoming white. Um, sort of the the unwitting, unintended consequences of of do-gooders of that era to try to rid them of their entire culture. Yeah, this is the uh, the the natural extend, uh, extension of the sort of white man's burden. These people were coming from a good place and that they were, you know, probably unlike most of society, uh, is utterly indifferent to the suffering and pain of these communities. These people are at least trying to do something, but they, they're so fundamentally stained by the racism and the supremacy of their culture that they can't see that they are committing a different form of genocide, a less violent form of genocide by their very methods. You know, that was so true uh, in various levels of, of grievance. But, um, you know, I mean, even the, 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 the uh, sports writers, they mm -hmm. thought they were being sympathetic to the Carlisle, you know, and they yeah. basically supported Jim Thorpe throughout his life and thought he'd been done wrong. Yeah. And yet all of those stories talked about, you know, they called every every uh, Native American athlete chief, you know, yeah. and, and every story had scalpings and people going on the warpath, you know, and it was just so ingrained into the white uh, 
culture that they didn't even re- think twice about what they were doing. Well, yeah, that's the that's the that that's the what the the reversal of that famous sports writer line about um, about Floyd Patterson. Um, uh, uh, a credit to his race, uh, the human race. Like it th- was so right. the trope of seeing black athletes as different and being held to different standards and rules. That's what that quote is playing against. Yeah, and it certainly played against Jim Thorpe and all of his teammates uh, throughout in Native American teammates throughout his career. So when you study uh, the life of one of these people, it must be strange. You sort of so immerse yourself. Do they become almost real to you? Like, is there a grieving process when you when you leave the book, or do they live forever with you? How does that How does that go? Well, it depends on the character. <laughs> I mean, after Clinton well, was my first biography, Bill Clinton, and uh, it was exhausting. I mean, fascinating, but yeah. but difficult and exhausting. So. I was kind of glad to get away from there, uh, you know, for a while. Um, but yeah, they. What happens is, um, and this started with Clinton, and I think it was an important lesson for me because, you know, that was a political. He was a political figure. Um, it was my first biography, and there were chapters in the book where I found him very admirable um, yeah. when he was like a young law professor at Arkansas really saving the first wave of black law students there and chapters where I found him um, not at all yeah. reputable and, and I didn't like him. And so as I was finishing that book, I really beat myself up and said, you know, what is it? This is a biography. Do you like this guy or not? Mm. And then I realized um, that he was that duality. Um, you couldn't separate the two. And that was him, and that's the way most human beings are to one degree or another. He perhaps, perhaps more so than others, and that he's he's my he's a character um, in my book, and I have to I have to appreciate that whatever he's doing to try to understand it, and that really has helped me through all of my biographies. I do become obsessed with them. Um, you know, at one point I can't remember which biography it was, but I was driving with my wife Linda and going up the street, and I made a left turn, but not onto a side street, but into a fire station. And she literally slapped me and said, David, what chapter are you on? (laughs) And so it does become that intense, you know, and I am living with these characters and they do stay with me um, until the next one comes along and sort of takes over the obsession. Because I imagine what you really love is the process, less than the specific person. It's the process of the immersion and the solving the equation of both the enigma of who they are, but the equation of like, how does the book actually work and go and what's in it, what's not in it? Exactly. I I do. Luckily, I love all of that, trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, some some, of the figures I've written about, uh, I like in the end more than others. I mean, I think Clementi was to me the one figure I wrote about who I was a little afraid of because I admired him so much, you know, but I ended up thinking the same way about him. Um, Thorpe is close. And the interesting thing about the Thorpe book is that most people who've read it see, um, and especially, and this was what would worry me, I, you know, I spent a month or two before I even started the real book just talking to Native American scholars to see if I could yeah. figure it out and if I was the right person to do it. And um, just this, uh, you know, at the National Book Festival, um, my interlocutor was Kevin Gover, who was the head of the uh, National Museum of American Indians and had been the head of the of the Indian Bureau and was a Pawnee from Oklahoma. And at the end, he thanked me for my understanding of it. And that meant an enormous amount to me. You know, that I'm trying to sort of get inside these people, be honest about everything about them, their their talents and their flaws, but from a sympathetic, humanistic viewpoint. Um, and so that's where I came out on Jim Thorpe. And a few people have read it and said, I don't like this guy, but very few. Um, and, and that says more about what they brought into the book than what, you know, what everybody brings in their own life into a book, a reading of a book. So I didn't worry about that. But but the people that I really cared about understood what I was trying to do. 
Well, to go to the idea of sort of loving the the, the process of it, I, it's kind of, I imagine, similar to where an athlete comes down. I remember Lance Armstrong said to me once that um, uh, he hated racing. He only liked practicing. <laughs> and that he the that the racing was what they paid him for, and you know as an author, I think you 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 have to like writing more than you like publishing. Oh, totally. I mean, the whole process after I'm done with the book is just anxiety. Uh, <laughs> first, you know, what are the what are the reviews going to be like? Is it going to yeah. sell? Are your people going to understand it? And then and then exhaustion. You know, traveling around. Well. Uh, it, it, this, the, my publisher is almost treating this book like COVID doesn't exist. I mean, I'm literally traveling to 22 different events, you know, and I'm doing and that this month myself. And that's exhausting. Um, um, so, but, but everything before that, I mean, I, I grew up in a newspaper family. I love to write. I don't get writer's block unless I haven't done the research which is what you learn as a trained journalist, you know, get the story first. Um, and if you, if you, if you're having trouble writing it, it's because you don't have the story. Yeah. Um, so I, I love the process of, of going there and getting the material and finding little pieces of gold in archives and then putting it all together. All of that I enjoy thoroughly. It's, it's what I do in life. You know, um, I'm kind of disorganized in other parts of my life, my wife would say, but, but for a book, I know how to do it, and I love doing it. Well, as as we wrap up, uh, sort of a publishing slash sports question. Um, you have a very touching dedication <laughs> at the beginning of the book to Alice Mayhew, having written about great coaches uh, and great athletes. What do you feel like uh, a great editor like her? was able to do? Because she worked with essentially every great uh, biographer and nonfiction writer of the second half of the 20th century. What did she do? Like, what was her secret? What If you were doing the Lombardi style book about her, what's the story there? You know, she had this rough, gruff exterior, but it, it, just like Lombardi did. But she knew exactly how to treat every individual writer. And with me, she knew I was sensitive um, and and that I knew how to do it on my own. And so her main function with me was, was um, you know, larger discussions about the, the larger meaning of my books and letting me figure out all of the details. Um, she, she didn't, she didn't um, really edit the, you know, edit the books in that sense, but she right. edited me in a larger sense. And she was incredibly encouraging um, and always sort of wanting to talk about the issues of the book. Um, and and understanding that I was one of those writers that didn't really need her to come in and pencil edit a book, but I did love the whole process of talking about it with her. And then she was fiercely um, defend, defending anything I did after that, you know, and pushing it and, and really believing in me and, and giving me the encouragement that, that made a lot of difference. Yeah, writers, unlike athletes, are more like, I guess, lone wolves. So it's probably closer to like, a great golf instructor or something uh -huh. than a Lombardi figure, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I mean, totally lone wolves. I mean, that was one of the great things about COVID is it didn't, didn't, I mean, it affected my travel some, but, but I could sit in my office anyway and write 12 hours a day, you know? So, and I was alone, uh, except for talking on the phone to friends or stuff like that, or, or hanging out with, with my wife. Um, it, was, it was closer to what we should be doing every day as opposed to disrupting what we normally do every day. It's isn't like, that oh, true? I mean, I, I really yeah. realized how much of my time is spent um, traveling, um, you know, when I went without before COVID or just doing things that, you know, that I didn't really have to do. Yes. Um, and uh, so for this book, you know, it was a plus and a minus, a plus that I didn't get to Stockholm. I mean, a minus, but, but sure. plus in that, that I really was able to focus almost entirely on what I was doing. Yeah, it's like people are, I remember uh, as the pandemic started to wane a little bit, people are like, are you going back to the grocery store? And I was like, never again in my life. I just, like, <laughs> I, lear I learned just how much or I was letting ordinary things that are actually quite uh, delegatable uh, take up chunks of my time and the opportunity costs when I did a book during COVID and it was 
five times easier than normally yes. doing a book. I was like, <laughs> oh man, I've been I've been white knuckling it for no reason. Same with me, exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I loved uh, not just this book, but the the Clinton book and the uh, the Lombardi book, and so it's been a it's been an honor to um, to talk with you. And uh, I think this one was wonderful, and I encourage everyone to read it. Thank you, Ryan. I really enjoyed the naturalness of this conversation.